Dr. Halima is a senior consultant pediatric cardiologist and fetal cardiologist at the Royal Hospital since 2014. She graduated from Sultan Qaboos uh, University in the year 2000, and she obtained her diploma of child health from Glasgow in 2014, and she opted to continue her residency training uh, from the Oman Medical Speciality Board. She also got her membership, Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health from UK in December 2007, and uh, fellowship training in pediatric cardiology from Saudi Arabia. In 2011, and she also had she did an extra fellowship training in fetal and neonatal cardiology at University of Alberta, Canada. Uh, Dr. Halima has been invited uh, to many um, workshops and conferences, uh, focusing Hendricks is focusing on fetal uh, echocardiography. Dr. Halima will be talking uh, today about. Um, obtaining and interpreting hard views, which is, I know it's a heavy and very important topics to all. Thank you very much and welcome, Dr. Halima. Uh, thanks, Nihal, for the introduction. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you today in this uh, webinar. And my talk will be about uh, obtaining uh, hard uh, uh, views. So uh, at the end of this lecture, uh, you will be able to describe uh, how to assist the cardiac uh, situs. Halima, if you share your slide, please. Ah, okay. Is it clear now? No, it didn't come. Yeah. Uh -huh. what? Is it open in your PC or in your laptop? Uh, yes. So do it again. Click share screen bottom. What about now? Not yet. Not yet. It's open and you, you, you opened it, so it's not like safe from so it's open. Is it uh, that time? Because sometimes, you know, you open it and close it by mistake. So make sure it's open. You don't see this. Uh, see your 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 PowerPoint, and then yeah, oh, yeah. Just so do you see it now? No. Strange. We just saw it. <laughs> ah. Double click, Halima. Stop share, Doctor, and start again from beginning, yes. from zero. Stop sharing first. Okay. So stop sharing. Make sure it's open, and then yeah. put it. Do it again. Okay. So now we'll do share again. You see when you're sharing, you see it coming up in your screen. Uh, yes, until I stop. Do you see it now? No. <laughs> um, Hello, Halima. Yeah. You can go out and join again. Yes, maybe then we can start with Dr. Divya, maybe meanwhile. Just a second, I'll, I'll, I'll do it again. Like, here you go. Stop this one. Last. I hope now you can see it. Still? Nothing. Nothing. Okay. Hal you know, you know the Zoom is small box now. Do you see it there? It's popping up. Yeah. I think you need to go out completely, maybe in and open your presentation. Okay, and um, what about now? No. So I can what just you can, you can do we'll yes. start with Dr. Adivia, leave the, the group and then rejoin again. Okay, sure. I think by, it happens sometimes. Maybe it disappeared, then you have to open it open it, leave the group, join the Zoom and open your presentation. Sure. First and then yeah, and keep it on until your so I think we'll move to Dr. Divya. Okay. Okay, so uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Divya, um, and 
I mean, we have listened to her earlier and she's a great speaker. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Divi actually is a, radio, uh, is a radiologist and she had her MD radio diagnosis in, uh, from India. And she's a fellow in advanced obstetrics and gynecology, ultrasound, Mediscan, Penai. Uh, she is a consultant radiologist in prime imaging and prenatal diagnostic in Chendigara. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. Uh, she's also uh, OB an ob ultrasound content expert, um, umbrella organization of ARDMS USA. She's also the member of ASWORG, uh, CME uh, Task Force, and a member of an online education working group of ASWORG. Um, awarded, she, is a, she has been awarded by Ministry of Health and Government of India um, and Department of Health at Chandigarh for providing service for pregnant women in, Chen, in the same area. She has many publications in peer review journals uh, and a book chapter, two book chapters. And she's been invited uh, uh, to speak here today on uh, assessing the placenta, uh, placenta and mutic fluid in singleton and twin pregnancies. Welcome, Dr. Divya. Sorry, I forgot to open my camera. <laughs> it's okay. So welcome, please then start. Thank you, Dr. Nihal for the kind introduction. Uh, I hope my screen is visible. Yeah, it's very clear. Yes, yes. thank you. Uh, at the outset, I would like to congratulate the Omani Society of uh, Ultrasound and OBGYN for having organized this uh, academic bonanza over the last two weeks. And uh, now I'll start my presentation on assessment of the placenta and amniotic fluid in singleton and twin pregnancies. At the end of this presentation, you will be able to recognize the differences in ultrasound appearances between placentas which are low lying and those which are not. And you'll be able to distinguish uh, between normal and abnormal amniotic fluid in singleton and twin pregnancies. The key questions that we'll answer in the next 30 minutes or so uh, would be the following. First, what are the key features that should be included in the correct ultrasound assessment and reporting of placental site? How should amniotic fluid be correctly assessed and reported? And what are the fetal conditions which are associated with oligohydramnios and polyhydramnios? Now let's see how we evaluate the placenta. I often consider placenta to be a neglected companion of the fetus, something that we fail to look at carefully and if we do, it can reveal a wealth of information. So let us see how we assess the placenta in the second trimester. First, we look at the placental site as to where the placenta is placed. For instance, as you see in this fetus at 22 weeks, this is the placenta which is placed along the anterior wall of the uterus. This is a transabdominal image and you can see the placenta here. The placental substance is normally seen as a relatively echogenic, homogeneous um, soft tissue lesion. And uh, it is slightly more bright than the posterior myometrium. As you can see, this is the retroplacental myometrium and this is the placental substance. And towards the amniotic cavity side, this thin echogenic film that you see covering the placenta is the chorionic plate. So this is what a normal placenta looks like in the second trimester. The anterior placenta is relatively easier to appreciate transabdominally. Posterior placental evaluation transabdominally may sometimes be difficult because of shadowing from the fetus, but here you can appreciate the placenta along the posterior wall. And uh, what we need to see when we see the placenta is to assess the, how far the lower edge of the placenta is in relation to the internal cervical os. As you see in this image, the distance between the inferior edge of this posterior placenta is around uh, 1.8 centim uh, centimeters, and uh, that is suggestive of a low-lying placenta. So you've had a look at the placental morphology. You've seen the relationship of the placenta with the internal cervical os, and you've measured the distance of the inferior edge of the placenta from the internal os to determine whether the placenta is low-lying or not. Now, as I said earlier, transvaginal imaging is preferable to transabdominal imaging because you get better quality, higher resolution images, and you're able to see the internal os very clearly, as well as the lower edge of the placenta. And you can get a more exact uh, estimation of the distance between the internal os of the cervix and the lower edge of the placenta. 
Now, let us see what are the requirements if we are to assess the placenta transabdominally in the second trimester. So if you want to see the placenta transabdominally, you need a full bladder. Also, there are restrictions posed by high maternal BMI or presence of abdominal scars. In addition, uterine contractures can also uh, hinder the delineation of the placenta. And that is why transvaginal imaging is preferable. Also, do not worry that if you put in a transvaginal probe in a case of placenta previa, it could precipitate bleeding. That doesn't happen. In fact, there are several studies which have established the safety of using transvaginal ultrasound in a cases of placenta previa. So you need not worry from that point of view. As you can see now, here we have two images. One image of an anterior placenta taken by the transabdominal route. This is the transabdominal image. It gives you a very good overview of the pelvis, but you can see that the internal loss and the cervical canal are not that clearly delineated. Of course, I can appreciate the cervical canal here. This is the hypoechoic cervical canal, but it's not as well seen as would be seen in the transvaginal image. And this you can appreciate is the placenta. And since the placenta is totally covering this internal loss, this is a case of anterior placenta previa, which you have assessed transabdominally. Note, we filled the urinary bladder to get a good view of the placenta here. Now, in contrast, when we would assess the placenta transvaginally, the bladder can be relatively empty. And of course, now see here how well you can appreciate this hypoechoic cervical canal. And it's very easy to identify that this is the internal os. And uh, you, internal os is usually at the level of this uh, utrovesical fold of peritoneum. So this is the internal os, as you, as you see here, ending. And uh, it's so easy to see that this is the placenta which is covering the internal os. So there is no doubt as to whether this is placenta previa or not in this uh, patient at 24 weeks of gestation with an anterior placenta. See, the placenta is relatively homogeneous. It is brighter than the adjacent myometrium. I want you to appreciate the normal appearance of the placenta in uh, all these images so that you can identify or understand the abnormal appearance better. Now, uh, some more second trimester transvaginal images of the placenta here. This is a 23 week singleton pregnancy. What do you see here? This is a transvaginal image. Uh, this is the cervix. This is the anterior lip of the cervix. This is the posterior lip of the cervix. Let us trace the cervical canal. As I'm moving, this is the cervical canal and the cervical canal will end up at the level of the internal os. So this is the internal os here. And this black thing that you see is the amniotic fluid, right? Now, do you see any placenta in this image? Are you are aware of the normal appearance of the placenta. It is relatively more bright. It is homogeneous. We don't see any placenta here. So this is a normal appearance. There is no low-lying or placenta previa in this case. What you see here are just the fetal parts. In contrast, see the other image. Again, this is a transvaginal image. First, you identify the footprint of the transvaginal probe. So transvaginal image. Now this is the cervix, this is the anterior lip, this is the posterior lip of the cervix, this is the cervical canal, and the cervical canal ends here. So this gives us the internal os. Now where is the placenta? We would already know by our transabdominal scanning that the placenta is on the posterior wall. And here you can see this more bright echogenic placental substance. This is the lower edge of this placenta and the distance between the lower edge and the internal os which is around one centimeter here, is low-lying. So this is what a posterior low-lying placenta looks like on transvaginal sonography in the second trimester. Now, how do we assess the anterior placenta? What are the probe movements that we do? As you can see in this image, there's one thing that you must realize, that just getting one image of the placenta is not enough. Just like when we are scanning the fetus, we look at the fetus in different planes from different angles, Similarly, when you're looking at the placenta, just don't bother to see the placenta in one image and that's it. You have to see the placenta in its entirety. So if you are assessing an anterior placenta, you have to see the placenta craniocaudally and move your probe from the maternal right to the maternal left so that you are covering the entire placenta as you scan. This is an example of an anterior placenta. So just this one image would not suffice when you're assessing the placenta. You would check it moving from right to left. 
in a craniocaudal fashion so that the entire placenta is imaged. Plus, normal placenta looking relatively homogeneous, echogenic, covered by this chorionic plate. And this is the normal retroplacental myometrium, which we also call as the retroplacental lucency. So this is something that you must appreciate in normal cases every time. What happens in posterior placenta? Now, as the name suggests, the placenta would be on the posterior wall. As you see here, this is the placenta on the posterior wall. Now, what is this? This is the normal myometrium along the anterior wall. This is the relatively more echogenic placenta. And right behind the placenta, this more hypoechoic area that you see is the retroplacental myometrium or the retroplacental lucent zone. Again, when you're seeing a posterior placenta, you need to be meticulous in your examination. Examine the entire placenta moving from maternal right to left in a craniocaudal manner so that you've covered the placenta right from its upper edge to the lower edge and its entirety from one side to the other. Now, besides being anterior and posterior, placenta can also be fundal in position, as you see in this case. Now, this is a fundal placenta, placental substance. This is the hypoechoic retroplacental myometrium, normal. What is this? This is the area of the cord insertion on grayscale. You can confirm that this is the cord insertion simply by switching on the color Doppler. And you can see this area lights up with color. So this is the cord insertion. And cord insertion, this is central cord insertion because it is at a distance of more than two centimeters from the placental margin. So this is a fundal placenta with a central cord insertion. Now, besides anterior, posterior, and fundal location, placenta can sometimes be situated along the lateral walls. So it might be just on the right lateral wall or the left lateral wall. And this is why this scanning technique would help you because if it was only on the right lateral wall of the uterus, you would see the entire placental substance only in this region. And as you would move towards the left, you would not see any placenta at all. And the vice versa, if it is in a left lateral wall position, you would see the placental substance only on the maternal left. And as you would move towards the right, there would be no placental tissue. So that is the importance of a meticulous scanning technique. Now, again, just to show you, this is a transvaginal image. First, let's identify the cervix, the anterior lip, posterior lip. This is the cervical canal. It has been, the cervix has been measured by using the calipers. This is the level of the internal os. And here, this is the entire placental tissue covering the internal os. Again, a case of placenta previa. Now, after so many, uh, seeing so many images, I'm sure you have a clear picture of placenta previa in your mind. And you know that placenta covers, the placenta previa uh, is one that covers part or all of the internal cervical os. It has an incidence of five per thousand deliveries. And it's a cause of painless vaginal bleeding in the second or third trimester. In fact, they say that if a patient who's never had a scan before and you haven't scanned her either, uh, if she presents with painless vaginal bleeding in the second or third trimester, one should treat it as a case of placenta previa unless proven otherwise. The clinical implications are that of any bleeding in that a patient can require transfusions. If the placenta previa is not detected at the time of delivery, she may need to undergo a hysterectomy because of uh, excessive uterine uh, interventions. The mother can also be susceptible to sepsis. There can even be maternal death. And of course, there can be a problem of prematurity for the fetus with three to four fold increase in perinatal mortality. But of course, all this can be avoided by correct antenatal diagnosis of placenta previa, which I'm sure by now, all of you are, are experts at doing. Now, a uh, low-lying placenta is when the placental edge is within two centimeters from the internal os, starting from 16 weeks of gestation. And we know that uh, placenta has a tendency to migrate from the lower segment with advancing gestation. And so low-lying placenta and placenta previa can resolve with advancing gestation. Studies have shown that if uh, in the, at the time of uh, the second trimester scan, that is around 18 weeks, if the placenta is covering the internal os by more than two centimeters, then the likelihood of resolution of such a placenta trivia are low. Obviously, if more of placenta is covering, then the chances that it will migrate up would be low. So that is uh, common sense or logic. 
if uh, there is more than uh, two centimeters, if the placenta is at a distance of more than two centimeters from the os, obviously it is quite far. And so this kind of a placenta uh, would definitely move away from the os uh, after 26 weeks in all cases. However, if placenta is within two centimeters from the internal os early on, then the likelihood of resolution is still quite high to the tune of 90%. Uh, so if uh, you see a case of low-lying placenta or placenta previa, say around 22, 24 weeks, then we rescan the patient by transvaginal ultrasound because especially in the third trimester, transvaginal ultrasound is, has a much more uh, important role to play because the baby's parts, the fetal parts are big and their acoustic shadowing can really hamper the visualization of the lower edge of the placenta as well as the internal cervical loss. So here transvaginal ultrasound is actually the mainstay and we uh, examine the patient at 32 weeks and if placenta previa or low-lying placenta persists, then she needs to be rescanned at 36 weeks prior to delivery. And remember, these are all transvaginal examinations which are perfectly safe. Now, again, this is just an image, transvaginal image. At 32 weeks, you can see how well you can visualize the cervical canal. There is no doubt as to where the internal os is. And you can see the placental substance. Note, do not uh, mistake the placenta with the myometrium. Placenta is more bright. It's more uh, echogenic as compared to the myometrium. And of course, this placenta is within two centimeters of the internal os. It is low line. The risk factors for placenta previa include a history of prior cesarean delivery, prior uterine surgery, pregnancy terminations, maternal smoking, advanced maternal age, multiparity, use of drugs like cocaine, and multiple pregnancy. There are certain pitfalls that you must keep in mind when looking for placenta previa. So there are certain conditions where you may end up making a false positive diagnosis of placenta previa and causing unnecessary anxiety to the patient. So that is something which we want to avoid. You see here two images. These are both transabdominal images of the patient, of the same patient, taken just 40 minutes apart. Now, in this case, one could end up making a false positive call of placenta previa and thinking that probably this placenta is covering the internal loss, which actually it is not. As you see in this image, this is the fetal head, the lower edge of placenta, this is an anterior placenta, the lower edge of placenta ends somewhere here and it is quite far away from the internal loss. As you've already must, you must have already seen, the main difference between these two images is that this is an uh, image taken with a nearly empty bladder and here this image has been taken after maternal bladder filling. So as I pointed out earlier, it's very important to have a full bladder when looking for placental uh, relationship with the cervix transabdominally. Another pitfall in diagnosing placenta previa. Now here again, if you just look at this image, these are again images of the same patient. So look at this image, this is a transabdominal image. And well, you might mistake this to be the cervical canal. And if you think this is the cervical canal, well then this placenta is sitting right on top of the internal cervical os. And then you might make a false positive call of placenta previa. But note, after a few minutes, they've written 20 minutes later, this is the same patient. And now you can see that the lower edge of placenta is here. And this is what the internal cervical os is. So os is here. This is the lower edge of placenta. It's quite far away from the os. This is not placenta previa at all. But is there a difference in bladder filling here? No. The difference here is that this space has opened up. This was actually a uterine contraction. This is myometrium. These are not the anterior and posterior lips of the cervix. The cervix doesn't look like this, I mean, not so thick. This is just the myometrium, the uterus has contracted, and as a result, you are getting this false appearance of a cervical canal, and this was actually a part of just the lower uterine segment, which you mistook for the cervix, and called this as a case of placenta previa. So whenever you see such an appearance, just wait, ask the mother to go out, relax, maybe eat something, come back after a few minutes, and once this contraction has resolved, you will realize that the placenta is not low at all. Now, next we come to a very um, dreaded condition, which is morbidly adherent placenta. And as we all know, uh, this is characterized by abnormal implantation of placenta into the uterine wall. What happens in this condition is that 
the placental the decidua which should normally develop under the placenta doesn't develop and as a consequence the trophoblasts in the placenta invade into the underlying myometrium now placenta accreta is the most common type in this the trophoblastic villi are just adherent to the myometrium this condition is seen in 75% cases of morbidly adherent placenta the next condition is placenta increta where the trophoblastic villi not only adhere but they enter or penetrate or invade the myometrium and the most severe form of morbidly adherent placenta is placenta percreta where the trophoblastic villi penetrate the myometrium and reach up to the serosa and maybe infiltrate adjacent organs like the urinary bladder obviously we all know that morbidly adherent placenta is associated with massive life threatening hemorrhage need for multiple transfusions the risk of cesarean hysterectomy and of course development of uh, uh, dic which can result in multi system organ failure and even maternal death so it's important that we diagnose this condition prenatally so that patient is delivered in a tertiary care institution with facilities uh, for surgery around the clock and blood bank facilities so this is where prenatal diagnosis is paramount if you want to optimize maternal fetal outcomes now what are the risk factors for placenta accreta when a patient walks in these are a few risk factors which you should have as a checklist which should make you alert and start looking actively for features of morbidly adherent placenta on ultrasound first is if she has an ultrasound report stating that she had placenta previa patient gives a history of prior cesarean section because not only placenta previa but you also need a uterine scar <coughs> where the decidua would be deficient and the trophoblastic tissue would invade ladies with advanced maternal age multiparity history of uterine surgery or endometrial ablation which would again damage the decidua leiomyomas uterine anomalies and hypertension and smoking have all been associated found to be associated with placenta accreta as you see in this bar chart as the number of cesarean sections increase the risk of having placenta accreta increases in fact after four cesarean sections the risk of having placenta accreta is as high as 60% on the other hand when a placenta previa is not noted in ultrasound the risk of placenta accreta is small that is less than 1%. So even if there is no placenta previa the risk of having placenta accreta is not zero it is less than 1%. So you must always be careful and look at the placenta every time with lot of care. Now what are the ultrasound features of placenta accreta? Certain features of ultrasound uh, of pl placenta accreta are evident even in early pregnancy. and that is presence of a low implanted gestational sac at around 6 to 8 weeks of gestation so if you scan a lady early on in pregnancy and you see a low placed gestational sac in the region of the cesarean section scar with thinning of the overlying myometrium in that region it is strongly suggestive of a cesarean scar pregnancy and this should alert you to the possibility of development of placenta accreta spectrum in the near future if you scan the lady in the second and third trimester the classic features of morbidly adherent placenta on ultrasound are certain gray scale features which include presence of multiple hypovascular lacunae as i said earlier normally the placenta is uniform it is echogenic but in morbidly adherent placenta this echogenic appearance is replaced by irregular hypoechoic spaces known as lacunae there is loss of the normal hypoechoic retroplacental zone i uh, showed you the ret retroplacental zone that is the normal retroplacental myometrium now if the trophoblastic villi are growing into the myometrium this normal hypoechoic retroplacental zone would be lost there is abnormality in the uterine serosa and urinary bladder interface again because of invasion of trophoblastic tissue and the retroplacental myometrial thickness is less to the tune of less than 1 mm if you switch on color doppler you will see turbulent blood flow within these lacunar spaces within the placenta and there would also be increased vascularity that is more vascularity than normal at the uterine bladder interface now this is just one video clip to show you the presence of this increased vascularity and flow within the lacunae in a placenta 
it's a morbidly adherent placenta. Now let's see the grayscale findings. As I said earlier, there is presence of lacunae. What are lacunae? These are these black hypoechoic spaces that you see within the placenta, giving a kind of Swiss cheese or a moth-eaten uh, appearance to the placenta. The placenta has lost its normal uniform echogenic texture here, and you see these black spaces. That is the lacunae. Uh, if you would switch on color here, you would see that there is just uh, increased vascularity at the utero-vesical interface, and the normal hypoechoic retroplacental zone has been lost. This is again an image showing the vascular lacunae. This image not only shows the increased vascularity at the bladder uterine interface, as you see here, it also shows increased vascularity in the cervical canal. So there can not only be increased vascularity in the uterus, but these varicosities can extend into the cervical canal. And this is very important to report because in these cases, a subtotal hysterectomy should not be planned because the cervical uh, vascularities would continue to bleed if you just removed the uterus and left the cervix in situ. This is another video clip to help you appreciate the difference between the normal and abnormal uh, placenta. So as you see here, this is the normal part of the placenta. You see the normal uniform echo texture. And here you could also, if you saw clearly, appreciate the hypoechoic retroplacental zone. But as you move to the area of morbidly adherent placenta here, you can appreciate now that now this placenta is showing these hypoechoic spaces, which are the lacunae. And this well-defined retroplacental lucency, which you see laterally, is hardly appreciated in this image. As you can see, this is a transvaginal image. And you can see how clearly you can appreciate that the retroplacental hypoechoic space, that is the hypoechoic myometrium, which you see just now, is not seen towards the end of the clip. And if some of you have noticed with a sharp eye, this appearance is actually seen in a fetus, which is at 13 weeks. So this is the appearance of a morbidly adherent placenta, which can be appreciated as early as 13 weeks, provided you are looking at the risk factors, you are looking at the placenta carefully. So the same ultrasound features, which you see in the second and third trimester, also seen in the first trimester, you just have to look every time very carefully. And this is just to show you the vascularity within these lacunar spaces, as well as in the adjacent cervical canal. Now, ultrasound identification of invasive placentation is quite good in expert hands. In fact, you can see that the overall sensitivity for detection of uh, invasive placentation by ultrasound is 91% with a specificity of 97%. Uh, the most common features that you see are placental lacunae. They have a sensitivity of 77%. The loss of hypoechoic space, that is loss of the retroplacental lucent zone, Again, it's highly specific because it makes sense. Placenta has invaded into the myometrium. And so this is a highly specific sign of placental invasion. And of course, abnormalities in the uterine bladder interface in the form of thinning in that region uh, and invasion of the placenta forming a contour bulge, again, has a high specificity of 99%, though it is not sensitive. That is, it's not seen that often, but if it is seen, then it is highly suggestive of placental invasion. Abnormality in color Doppler, is also a highly sensitive feature. But I would stress again that most of the time we make this diagnosis on grayscale and color Doppler is just an add-on. So we don't make this diagnosis only on the basis of color Doppler. Mostly the diagnosis is made on the basis of 2D appearance and color Doppler just adds, uh, helps in confirmation. It just helps in adding to the diagnosis. And of course, whenever you are scanning, you have to ensure that you've taken a history of uterine surgery. There's a history of uterine uh, instrumentation because there has to be some damage to the decidua and the placenta is either low-lying or, of course, covering the internal os. Coming to placental abruption. Now, placental abruption, as we all know, is a painful cause of vaginal bleeding. It can be associated with pain in the lower back and uterine contractions. It has an incidence of 0.5 to 1% and can present as hypoechoic subchorionic thickening. The problem with placental abruption is that sometimes if the blood is contained within the uterus and the hematoma is away from the internal os, the patient may have pain, but they may not be frank bleeding. And as a result, the ultrasound detection rate of 
placental abruption is also not very high. It is to the tune of 50%. So remember that sup supposing a patient has clinical features of abruption, but you have a normal ultrasound, it does not completely rule out abruption. If you see placental separation with active bleeding, then of course it's a maternal uh, fetal emergency and requires immediate management. Now this is an example showing you how difficult it is actually to appreciate placental abruption. Because what happens is when the blood bleeding is acute, it is actually almost similar in echogenicity to the myometrium and it is sometimes very uh, difficult to appreciate the retroplacental blood collection as you see here. This is this crescentic uh, retroplacental blood collection which is seen uh, shown in this image and you can see how similar in echogenicity it is to the myometrium. And that is why ultrasound is not that sensitive in detection of uh, placental abruption, especially when it is very acute. However, placent retroplacental hematoma, as you can see in this image, is seen as a crescent-shaped avascular area of low echogenicity between the placenta here and the uterine wall. Now, a word about amnionicity and chorionicity of twins. I'm sure this is just a recap. And you're aware that there are three types of uh, twins based on amnionicity and chorionicity. Uh, dichorionic twins in early pregnancy are typically seen as two gestational sacs, as you see here. And between 11 to 14 weeks, you see the characteristic twin peak or the lambda sign and two gestational sacs. So um, chorionicity is established by the presence of this uh, lambda sign or the twin peak sign. And uh, you can appreciate this same sign much better here. So dichorionic, diamniotic twin gestations, there are two separate placentae, there are two amnions. Then monochorionic, diamniotic. So monochorionic have got a single placenta, but two separate amnions. So early in pregnancy, there will be just one gestational sac in monochorionic twins with two fetal poles and two separate amnions, as you see here. Later on, between 11 to 14 weeks, you would not appreciate that lambda sign because of the growth of chorionic tissue. In monochorionic twins, there is single placenta and what you would appreciate is the empty delta sign or the T sign as you see here and two separate uh, sacs. And finally, in monochorionic monoamniotic twins, there would be a single gestational sac containing both the feti there would be no separating intertwin membrane because there is only one amnion and you can often see cord entanglement. Uh, you can appreciate the two different cord insertion sites on the same placenta in these MOMO twins. Now, how do we evaluate amniotic fluid? Uh, let's see. Uh, first, we need to know what amniotic fluid is composed of. So in the first trimester, amniotic fluid volume, can uh, the amniotic fluid can come either from the placenta or membranes. It's not typically renal in origin. The contribution by fetal urine begins from 16 week onwards, and there is some amount of contribution to the amniotic fluid uh, from the lungs as well. This is important to know because uh, cases of bilateral ren renal agenesis would present with normal amniotic fluid volumes in the first trimester, because in the first trimester, kidneys are not contributing much to the amniotic fluid and they would present only after 16 weeks when kidneys take up the function of forming the amniotic fluid. If you see that the amniotic fluid volume is normal, it is very reassuring because it helps in assessing fetal well-being. Now you know that if amniotic fluid is normal, that means fetal has normal kidneys, it's urinating well. Also, uh, since there is some contribution from the lungs, it helps in assuring that the lungs are developing well. Thirdly, since the amniotic fluid is ingested by the fetus, if the amniotic fluid volume is normal, it reassures us that the gastrointestinal tract is also fine. Now, abnormalities in amniotic fluid can range from decreased amniotic fluid when it is termed as oligohydramnios, absent an uh, amniotic fluid, that is anhydramnios, or polyhydramnios, that is increased amniotic fluid volume. It's important to understand how to measure the amniotic fluid properly. Now, uh, first I'll explain how to measure the amniotic fluid index. As you see in this image, for the amniotic fluid index, we need to measure the amniotic fluid pockets in four different quadrants of the maternal abdomen. And we use the umbilicus as the landmark to divide the abdomen into four different quadrants. What would you do if you had to measure the amniotic fluid 
say before at around 22 weeks when the uterus has not gone above the umbilicus in that case you would divide the lower abdomen the maternal lower abdomen into four different quadrants because the uterus would be confined only in this area if you were to measure the amniotic fluid volume in the early second trimester now after you've divided the maternal abdomen or the uh, the area where the uterus is into four quadrants next you need to be careful about how you place your transducer the transducer should always be placed in such a fashion that it is perpendicular to the floor now what is the logic behind this as you can see here in this image now here the transducer is perpendicular to the floor so you are measuring the amniotic fluid pocket which is right underneath your probe and this is the correct uh, dimension of the pocket if you place your transducer obliquely then you actually end up measuring a contralateral amniotic fluid pocket you don't measure the uh, fluid pocket underneath the transducer but actually a fluid pocket which you have you have already measured here so this can result in overestimation of amniotic fluid volume because here you would have measured it correctly and when you would come obliquely on the other side you would again measure the pocket which has already been measured so to get the correct uh, amniotic fluid index please ensure that the probe in that particular quadrant is perpendicular to the floor while you are measuring the amniotic fluid it's a good idea to ensure that you're not pressing the maternal abdomen too hard because see when you press the size of the deepest vertical pocket decreases as i said earlier the amniotic fluid index is a sum of the deepest vertical pockets which are devoid of fetal parts or umbilical cord loops and you add up all the th uh, four deepest vertical pool pockets as you see here the screen can sp be split into four simply and the software can automatically give you the afi which in this case is 12 so as you know normal afi ranges between 5 to 24 cm so this is a normal amniotic fluid volume afi uh, is typically measured after 16 weeks of gestation when it is less than 5 cm it is suggestive of oligohydramnios and afi more than 24 cm is suggestive of polyhydramnios the deepest vertical pocket is uh, another way of uh, estimating the amniotic fluid volume and it can be measured in any quadrant it just has to be the deepest vertical pocket the normal deepest vertical pocket ranges uh, the normal ranges between 2 to 8 cm it's oleg when it's less than 2 cm and polyhydramnios when the deepest vertical pocket is more than 8 cm so this is normal amniotic fluid volume or deepest vertical pocket of 3.7 now studies have seen that it's better to quantify oligohydramnios using the deepest vertical pocket because it results in fewer unnecessary obstetrical interventions with no difference in the fetal outcomes when compared to the amniotic fluid volume so in the setting of oligohydramnios it's better to rely on the deepest vertical pocket in making a call of oleg uh, oligohydramnios because this would help you in avoiding unnecessary obstetrical interventions without affecting the fetal outcome again um, just to recap actually polyhydramnios dvp deepest vertical pocket more than equal to 8 cm afi greater than equal to 24 cm now here you can see we've measured the afi by calculating the deepest vertical pockets in four different quadrants and we when we add them we get an afi of 30 so this is a case of polyhydramnios and here again we've measured the deepest vertical pocket in four different quadrants getting an afi of 4.2 and this is a case of oligohydramnios now note here we've made extra effort and switched on the color doppler well this has hey, been Dr. Divya, yes ma'am for the time sake i'll give you more time like two or three minutes maybe because okay, we are I'll, going I'll, much beyond time thank you perfect perfect i'll just find up so um always when you're measuring the deepest vertical pockets please ensure that uh, you switch on the color doppler so as to avoid taking the umbilical cord loops into account polyhydramnios can have a variety of causes which can be idiopathic diabetes or fetal anomalies and of course when you have increased liquor there's a risk of having preterm labor and delivery which can increase perinatal mortality oligohydramnios most common cause is premature rupture of membranes however there can be other causes like placental insufficiency fetal renal anomalies maternal disorders as well as 
consequences of multiple pregnancies like twin to twin transfusion syndrome and fetal growth restriction. Oligohydramnios can again have increased perinatal mortality and result in fetal deformations because baby doesn't have enough space to move so there can be limb deformities. Therefore, please keep in mind that when you're measuring the AFI, do that with your transducer perpendicular to the floor. Look, uh, when you uh, see polyhydramnios, measure the AFI. When you see oligohydramnios, go for the deepest vertical pocket. And of course, you need to follow up these patients. When you assess amniotic fluid in twins, please use deep vertical pocket, do not use AFI. And how do you measure the deepest vertical pocket? Just keep the intertwin membrane as a landmark and measure the deepest vertical pocket on either side so that you ensure that you're not measuring the same sac. Coming to monochorionic, there are certain uh, abnormalities of lyca which are, suggest which are more seen in monochorionic twins. For instance, this is twin to twin transfusion syndrome which is characterized by polyhydramnios in the recipient and oligohydramnios in the donor. Thus, to summarize, uh, as we all know, a placenta is said to be low-lying when it is within two centimeters from the internal loss, and these pregnancies are considered at risk. Vaginal bleeding with ultrasound evidence of placental separation is an obstetric emergency because it's an abruption. And placenta accreta should be excluded in all cases with low anterior placenta and a previous cesarean. As you all know, the criteria for normal amniotic fluid index are these. And remember, in multiple pregnancies, measure deep vertical pocket and not AFI. Polyhydramnios is, is associated with increased risk of poor outcome due to preterm delivery. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Devi. It was great, uh, excellent, and comprehensive uh, presentation. I, we are all heavy topics today. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, I'm sorry for that. Uh, no, it's very good. It's time. excellent. No, no, it's excellent. So I think, I hope Dr. Halima can share her screen. Let's see. Um, yeah, let me just switch off my... Dr. Halima, are you here? Yeah. <laughs> uh, tell me. Ex yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Mabrook. <laughs> Okay. So uh, good evening again, everybody. My talk will be about obtaining and interpreting heart views uh, correctly. The time given to me 45, but I think uh, I will finish maybe in uh, half an hour or might be less. So all of us know that uh, the um, heart is a 3D complex uh, structure. It's dynamic. And it's constantly moving when you are uh, doing the scanning. So it's very important to have really a formal strategy for evaluating it. The objectives of this uh, lecture, uh, to be able to describe how to assess the cardiac situs, which means that to demonstrate that the heart is in the correct uh, position. And uh, we'll describe the uh, key features of the four planes, which I'm going to mention, uh, required to assist the fetal heart uh, correctly. At the end, uh, I'll show you some videos so that you can recognize the differences between the normal and the most common abnormal cardiac ultrasound appearances of the four planes. What are the key ultrasound uh, features of uh, plane seven, that's uh, the chest? So we'll, here are the four planes. So uh, after that, what the probe movements required to move through the four cardiac planes correctly? What are the key ultrasound features of plane uh, 10, the three vessel uh, trachea view? And which abnormalities we can exclude after correct uh, assessment of the planes from seven to 10? So the, fair, the four planes which I'm going to talk about from seven to 10 are the uh, plane seven about the lungs and for chamber view of the heart, plane eight about the left ventricular outflow tract, plane nine about the RVOT, the right ventricular outflow tract and crossing nature of the LVOT and plane 10 about the three vessel trachea view uh, of the heart. 
uh, plane seven, uh, basically not only the heart, the heart and the uh, chest and the lungs. So plane seven describes the uh, axial section of the chest. Uh, plane eight, you need to manipulate the probe so that within the left ventricle, you can see the left ventricle outflow tract. And this uh, plane is slightly higher than the four chamber view, which is in plane seven. For plane uh, nine, the RVOT, as we continue to move up toward the head, then we come to this uh, plane and it trans crossing over the LVOT. Uh, finally, we can see where these two outflow tracks, the RVOT and LVOT come together at the level of the ductus, and this is uh, plane 10. For the four chamber view, so uh, it's very important to obtain one complete rib. This is an axial section. If you are in oblique view, then you will get segments of different uh, ribs. So very important to get a complete rib so that you can really assess the, the heart. So this is anterior, spine will be posterior. And this is the four chamber view. We know that the heart occupies around 30 to 35% of the uh, cardiothoracic uh, ratio. So here is the apex. Here will be the base of the heart. We have the two atria, the two ventricles. We have the interventricular septum. We have both AV valves, the tricuspid and the mitral valve where they meet at the atrioventricular septum. And here where we see the crux of the heart. It's very important to note that the interventricular septum is approximately at 45 degrees to the anterior posterior uh, diameter of the chest wall. If you see significant left or right heart axis deviation, then this can be associated with uh, certain cardiac uh, abnormalities. In fourth chamber view, when we look at the atria, we need to see the entrance of at least two pulmonary veins into the left uh, atria. Here we see the crux of the heart. When you don't see this crux, then you have a case of ostium brimum defect or ASD brimum. Very important to see or to look at the offsetting nature of the two AV valves, meaning that they are not at the same level. The tricuspid valve will be uh, located more apical compared to the uh, mitral, which is more up. After the fourth chamber view, we move to the plane eight, that's the left ventricular outflow tract. So when you come up, you need to tilt the probe toward the left shoulder. So you see here the left ventricle and coming out of it aorta, which is committed only to the left uh, ventricle. We call the left ventricle posterior. And here we see part of the anterior uh, right ventricle. It's very important to note that there is continuity between the interventricular septum here and the left ventricular outflow tract. And it comes at an angle. There should be no gap here. And I'll show you some abnormalities associated when there is no continuity uh, in the, within the interventricular septum. The RVOT, plane nine. So here we see the pulmonary valve, usually to be echogenic, and it's wrapping around the circular uh, aorta, and here is the superior vena cava. Here is the main pulmonary artery or the pulmonary trunk bifurcating. Here we see the right pulmonary artery and here the continuation of the ductus. So in this view, we don't see the left pulmonary artery. 
Next view, we go from four chamber view tilt. More superiorly, we go to the three vessel view or three vessel trachea view. So spine will be here, then this is posterior. Here will be anterior. This will be the left side already, we know that. And here will be the right side. So we have the pulmonary, aorta, and SVC. And the pulmonary will continue as uh, ductal arch, the aorta will continue as transverse arch, forming the V sign. So now back to the four chamber view. The important thing before jumping into the four chamber and say that the RV or LV, decide about what's called the fetal laterality. Fetal laterality means identifying the right and left side of the fetus. I believe in OB gynae, you have your own way in determining the right and left side of the uh, fetus. And from there you decide where is the right and left side of the heart in relation to the right and left side of the fetus. In fetal cardiology, we use uh, what's called Cordis method. So you can use either way, as long as, as at the end you are getting the correct diagnosis and you are making sure that really you identify the right and the left side uh, correctly because this will affect your whole diagnosis and you should not mix or make wrong diagnosis in cases like, for example, stroke or uh, isomers. After making sure about the fetal laterality, you'll be able to determine the other organs also, like where is the stomach and where is the heart? Are they located on the left side, which is uh, normally? Uh, Nihal, do you hear me? Yes, yes, your voice is clear, Halima. Uh, but uh, mm -hmm. you continue presenting. Uh, your voice is nice. Okay. Then we move from the chest, we move at the abdominal uh, level. So, Halima, now there is disconnection of your voices. Oh, the internet is poor, it looks like. I can't hear. Halima, do you hear us? Oh, there is a problem. Shukra, Dr. Moza, we shake the muscle. Halima, can you unmute yourself? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, your voice is clear. Yes. Yeah, so you can continue the presentation, dear. Okay. And this, yeah. just share screen again, yeah. Okay, so what I presented before was not visualized? Yeah, you can start from this slide here. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay, so uh, this is to comment on the abdominal situs. So here posterior, the spine, anterior, this is the left side where we see the stomach, right side will be here the liver and gallbladder. The IVC is anterior to the right and the aorta is posterior to the left. When we see this view, we say situs solitus. Uh, Moza, do you hear me? Yes, your voice is clear. Continue, okay. having, but be yeah. quick in your... Uh, yeah, but the, I don't know what is really the problem because I cannot go to the... It looks uh, like it's getting stuck, your stuck, presentation. Yeah. I cannot go further to the next slides. I don't know what's the, uh, the problem. Oh. Hmm. Can you... Is it with my device or net connection? Really, I don't know. Did you share? It's shared screen. Can you un? Um, it is already shared, shared it. the screen. Uh, 
Move to the next slide, Halima. It's not moving, Moza. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. Okay, come come uh, out of the uh, what is this uh, slide show? Come out of the slide show. Yeah, click down the slide show. One coming. Uh, yeah, I know. It just maybe minimize. Yeah. I think, Do you see it now? Uh, yes. yeah. I think yes. your screen is too big, so that's yeah. why it's slowly moving. Okay. Um, okay, perfect. So. After seeing the, that the abdominal and the normal site is So here we see the uh, aorta and aorta is, a, as we know, it's a posterior uh, structure in front of the spine. And they mentioned that the uh, heart occupies 30 to 35%. Moving now to the cardiac position, we know that the heart would be on the left side of the chest. So here, if you look at the right ventricle, left ventricle, and left atrium, these three structures form two thirds of the cardiac image. And here lies the cardiac uh, axis, while the other third formed by the right uh, atrium. So the cardiac axis, if we draw a line again from posterior to anterior across the midline and another line, through the interventricular septum, the cardiac axis will lie here. And it's around 45 plus or minus 15 to 20 degree. And if it is more than that, if it is more to the right uh, side than right axis deviation or more to the left, left axis deviation, and there are certain cardiac conditions associated uh, with that. So seeing this video showing the uh, four chamber view. And uh, if we look here, for example, we have the two atria, we have the two AV valves. And this is what I was mentioning about the crux. If it is, if there is a defect here, then it will be ostium primum. Here, there is the foramen ovale, which should be, uh, this will be normal in every fetus. And then moving to the uh, interventricular septum, and we have the two ventricles, the right ventricle and the left uh, uh, ventricle. As I said, they'll be offsetting. The tricuspid valve will be down um, compared with the uh, mitral. The septal leaflet of the tricuspid valve is more close to the septum, so we call it septophilic, while the mitral is away from the septum, so it is septophobic. And here is the entrance of the two pulmonary veins. It's very important to do always 2D and then uh, color doubler uh, when you scan the heart. There should be no gap between the left atrium and the aorta. If there is a gap here, then suspect that there is a confluence where the pulmonary veins, instead of draining individually into the left atrium, they might be coming into a confluence, draining into the uh, left atrium. The ventricle, you need to know that the ventricle always follow the valve. So if uh, this is tricuspid valve, then this must be a right ventricle, even in conditions where the ventricles are inverted. So the ventricle follows the valve. To say that this is a right ventricle, uh, we can see it's trabeculated. There is a moderator band. Also, there is here the tricuspid valve. While the left ventricle has, uh, it will be more smooth. And here is the uh, apex, and there is no moderator band. Uh, if we go back to this uh, view and we put color, sometimes difficult to see if there is a VSD because the beam of ultrasound is parallel. It has to be perpendicular, like for example, in this view. So if there is a VSD here and you put color doubler, it will show you the uh, shunt. And also we need to look that there is no bricardial diffusion. Having a small rim of bricardial diffusion, two to three millimeters, Regarding the atria, they should be equal in size. The uh, flab of foramen ovale should be in the left uh, atrium. And the shunt in the fetus across the foramen ovale will be right to left. Here, uh, Tilted uh, more posteriorly, you can see the coronary sinus. Uh, Nihal, do you still hear me? 
Yes, your voice is clear. Yeah, yeah, it's clear. Okay, so just here, I want to point that sometimes during scanning, when we go more posterior, we see this structure and we think it is abnormal. Actually, this is a normal finding, and we call it coronary sinus. Uh, in the fetus, the SVC, superior vena cava, and the IVC, they drain into the right atrium, and the venous system goes to the coronary sinus and finally into the right atrium. So this is a normal structure when you see it, when you do the four chamber view and you tilt more uh, posteriorly. Uh, again, here the foramen ovale, and again, I am emphasizing that it's a normal structure. And uh, when you do scanning, always better not to tell the mother that there is an ASD secondum because this is a normal finding. And even when we do the scan, we tell about the limitations in fetal echo, we tell them that there might be an ASD secondum postnatally, but about the size, it is not uh, accurate when we do it uh, in fetal life. So it's a normal finding. Postnatal examination will be confirmed by pediatrician. But about the ostia, or the, about the septum of primum, you can't tell during fetal uh, echo scanning uh, because the crux should be here and should be intact, and you should not see uh, ostium uh, primum defect here. Because sometimes you really get referrals about uh, ASD secundum in fetal life, and uh, we will reply that this is a normal uh, finding. So regarding ventricular chambers, uh, the two ventricles approximately equal in size, and we know after 30, 32 weeks, the right ventricle will be more uh, dominant. There should be no ventricle wall hypertrophy. Uh, uh, the moderator band will make the right ventricle looks uh, more bulky, but there should be no ventricular wall hypertrophy, except in, in some pathology or a mother with uh, diabetes. And as I mentioned, the ventricular septum should be intact from apex to the uh, crux. This is this diagram showing here the right ventricle, and this is the moderator band. See how thick, and sometimes you'll think that there is a mass or tumor within the RV, but in fact, it is the moderator band. Again, here the interventricular septum, the moderator band, and the cordy tendony, which also differentiate between the RV and LV. Uh, they come from the tricuspid valve and they have direct insertion into the uh, ventricular wall. Uh, as I mentioned again, the left ventricle will be smooth walled and here we have the uh, apex and there is no moderator band. Regarding the AV uh, junction and valves, the two AV valves, the mitral and the tricuspid should open and close freely. And there should be an offsetting. If there is no offsetting, think about AVSD. If there is too much offsetting, like for example, the tricuspid valve, too much down this place, think about the uh, Epstein anomaly. To uh, tell about the offsetting, if we draw a line here across both AV valves, you will see that the tricuspid is slightly lower than the mitral, but not too much down. If it is too much down, then here, think about Epstein anomaly. So in fourth chamber view, we covered uh, all these. And then finally about the uh, cardiac rhythm. When you scan the heart, it's very important to look at the squeezing of the uh, heart muscle. The heart rate we know should be more than 100, less than 180. Uh, at gestational uh, age or gestational week of 20, the heart rate might be more than 110 and about uh, 160. You can check the heart rate either through M mode or pulse uh, wave doubler. And uh, from there, you can decide about the contractility and the heart rate. Because this is basic uh, ultrasound, uh, then I will not go into deep, how to, uh, deeply to assess the uh, cardiac rhythm. And as I mentioned to comment at the end about the pericardial effusion, where it should not be uh, more than four millimeters. Uh, here I'll show you some uh, abnormalities. So this is uh, 2D showing the left ventricle and the um, LVOT, right ventricle and the pulmonary. There is crossing nature, so this is not TGA. And here we are not sure about if there is a VSD. Always do uh, 2D and then color. And when you put color doubler, you start to see the 
uh, VSD. We call this one muscular VSD, mid-muscular VSD, and the from left to right in the three from right uh, to left. If the uh, VSD above the moderator, moderator band, then it is uh, mid-muscular. If it is below the moderator band level, then it is an apical uh, VSD. Another uh, example here, or uh, VSD, this is again 2D. So as I said here in the ventricular septum, there should be continuity with the ascending aorta. There should be no gap here. But here we can see there is a defect by 2D. There, it, is, it is not a dropout because here, the ultrasound is not parallel, it is perpendicular. And also it is echogenic, so it is not an artifact. And confirmed by uh, Keller, so it's an up, uh, out, uh, outlet, very membranous VSD, which is a common type, most common type of VSD. Then again, another uh, abnormality in four chamber view. So this will be the AVSD. Here is the flap of foramen ovale into the left uh, ventricle, uh, two pulmonary veins. This is what I'm telling you here. The thorax is not intact as I showed in the other diagram. So this is ASD primum. ASD primum in context of AVSD, and the septum is not intact. There is a hole here, there is a VSD. So this is complete AVSD. And always we need to tell the mother that there is 50% chance to have uh, a fetus with Down uh, syndrome and or to offer amniocentesis. Again, in four chamber view by 2D, and this can be even early, early uh, pregnancy if there is single ventricle or univentricular heart. You can see here there is one big atrium, one big ventricle. The other atrium and ventricle look really small, supported here by the uh, color. So this patient with hypoblastic left uh, heart. So this is in uh, plane uh, seven. This is the summary of all the things which I, uh, I have mentioned. In four chamber view, you can exclude cyclic abnormality. You can exclude octopia cordis when the heart is outside the chest. You can exclude single ventricle or univentricular heart. You can exclude AVSD. You can exclude the recardial infusion. By getting proper four chamber view, you can rule out or you can increase the sens sensitivity of your cardiac straining between 30 to 40%. Uh, and you can increase this to 70% by obtaining the outflow uh, tract. So this is the LVOT, this is plane eight. I told you about the angle, which we normally see. So this is the left ventricle, uh, this is the interventricular septum, and here is the angle where it continues with the ascending aorta. If there is no angle, then this means that there is a defect. So there is a VSD, uh, and in cases like overriding of uh, aorta. Here is the example. So uh, here seeing the right ventricle, left ventricle, left ventricle outflow tract. We don't see here that angle. So suspect here a defect, a VSD. If there is a VSD here, then there will be an overriding of aorta. As we mentioned, the aorta should be committed or coming only from LV. But in this view, part of it coming from LV and part from RV. So we call it overriding of aorta. When you see overriding of aorta, Go and look at the pulmonary valve. How is the size? Is it small or no? And think about the trilogy of fallow or double outlet right ventricle. Condition, you can uh, detect it. Or when you can. Here, the LV not giving us the aorta. In fact, it's giving us a vessel which is branching. So, this uh, pulmonary is coming out of LV, and this is transposition of great uh, artery. By obtaining left ventricle outflow tract, you should see that there is mitral aortic. 
Halima, can you double check your connection, please? You can't hear me, Moza. I don't know why it, you have this. It's problem. cutting off. It comes and goes sometimes. Try again. Yeah. Now, can you hear me? Yes. We hear, but maybe just a little, maybe closer to the mic and see because when you go, maybe before it cuts off, try like this and see. Okay. okay. Uh, how about now? It's fine. Good. So, and transposition of great arteries. Uh, no, your connection is not good, Halima. I don't know. I think I think Moza is the same. Dr. With Halima, you. I suggest you sh close your video. Just uh, try after closing your video. Don't uh, open your video. Just uh, you switch off the video and speak. Maybe that might uh -huh. help. Because sometimes when connection is poor, if you stop your video and then speak only, that also helps. Just close your videos. Just close your camera. Uh, uh, do you hear me now or no? We hear you. Yeah, because only have few few more slides. I I will try not to show the video. Yes, although I think it's uh, very important to show the video. No, your video, your, your camera, see. your web camera. She means you. Your I, I mean your web camera. <laughs> your web camera, not the presentation. Your, you switch off your web camera, ma'am. Yeah, try now. The last. Or superiorly, so we see the pulmonary continuum, the aorta continuum, transverse arch. Halima, can you go? Can you go back to the slide where you explain about the right outflow? And please again check your connection. Okay. Yeah. So, thank you. Okay. So, do you hear me now better? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, uh, you mean this image, uh, Moza? Yes. Okay. So, uh, plane nine about right ventricle outflow tract. This is here, we'll see the right ventricle. This echogenic will be the pulmonary valve. This is the pulmonary artery or pulmonary trunk. This is the right pulmonary artery. This is the ductal. In this view, we don't see still the left pulmonary artery. And in cross section is the uh, aorta. So, pulmonary and aorta. It's very important to see the crossing nature, as I mentioned, between the LVOT and RVOT. So if very good uh, for chamber view, LVOT, RVOT, then sensitivity will be 70% that will not miss cardiac abnormality. To increase it furthermore to 90%, you need to add the three vessel trachea view. And from four chamber view, we tilt more anteriorly. So uh, we need to see what's called the V sign where the pulmonary uh, continue as ductal, aorta continue to the transverse arch, and they join together at the descending uh, aorta. And here we'll see pulmonary, aorta, and SVC. So it should be in this arrangement. If it is not like this arrangement, then this is abnormal three vessel view. In the same view, you will see the thymus, which is an anterior uh, structure. If you don't see the thymus and the patient has Coarctation, for example, or any arch of normality like interrupted aortic arch, then 100% you are dealing with a case of uh, uh, digorge or deletion of 22Q11 syndrome. So if no thymus and arch abnormality, always think about uh, digorge study and we need to do fish study for the patient.
in three vessel view, as I said, very important to see that it's a V sign. And here a small structure is the trachea. Then if it is like this, we, we don't think about vascular ring because, because both the aortic arch and ductal arch on one side and the trachea on the other side. Uh, meaning to say that the aortic arch is no, and the pulmonary, they are not uh, forming a vascular uh, ring. Uh, always, as I said, 2D and color, because color will tell you exactly about if there is any discrepancy or if there is any obstruction in one of these uh, vessels. So here again, pulmonary aorta SBC, and as we know, pulmonary will be on the left and SBC on the uh, right. If there is an obstruction, for example, uh, severe pulmonary stenosis or severe aortic stenosis or palpation, there will be flow reversal. Then it will be abnormal. Yeah. Yeah. Reem? So, yeah. Yeah. so uh, only three vessels to be seen. If there is another fourth uh, structure here, then it will be left SVC. Here again, emphasizing about the three vessel and the thymus, as I mentioned. So what are the detectable abnormalities from three vessel view? You can rule out aortic stenosis, severe pulmonary stenosis, transposition of great arteries because it will not be normal, hypoplastic with heart, right aortic arch or vascular ring, interrupted arch, and I'll show you examples in the coming slide. This is an interesting, I hope, do you hear me? Because this is really very important. An interesting. Uh, yes, yes, Halima, we hear you. Oh, okay, one by one. So, uh, TGA, I'm talking about three vessel view. You will see only two vessels. So, you'll see here the aorta. You will not see the pulmonary because it is posterior and under the aorta. In this plane, only you will see the aorta and the SPC. Right aortic arch. So, this is right ventricle, left ventricle. I told you in three vessel view, we should see what's called the V sign. But here you don't see the V sign. It is actually like a U shape or C shape. And here the trachea in the middle, then suspect right aortic arch and uh, vascular ring. So you need to send for fetal echo. Here, hypoblastic left arm. So this is the pulmonary continuum as ductal. pulmonary continue as ductal, and aorta continue as transverse. See the marked discrepancy between them. So the aorta even less than half size of the ductal. And here there is brief flow reversal. This is again abnormal. So there is an arch obstruction. This is abnormal three vessel view. Tetralogy of fallow. So this tetralogy of fallow, we know the pulmonary will be smaller, the aorta will be more dilated. So you expect that the aorta will be more dilated and here is the pulmonary. So again, it is abnormal. And finally, interrupted aortic arch. When you do three vessel view and, so this is pulmonary and ductal. When you see that you cannot open the transverse arch in this view, the, here will be the descending aorta. So pulmonary, ductal, descending. And here is the aorta, but you cannot open it. Always think about interrupted aortic arch. So these are examples of uh, detectable abnormalities in uh, three vessel. So the key point for the four planes, which I have mentioned, plane seven, about the situs, the axis, the fourth chamber view about the ventricle equal in size, contractility, plane eight about the LVOT, and the LVOT does not divide, aortic valve should be normal. RVOT in plane nine, the pulmonary is anterior to aorta, pulmonary aorta similar size. And finally, plane 10, the three vessel view, pulmonary aorta should be same size, same color, descending and aorta arch should be on the left of trachea, should not surround the trachea. Uh, that's for my presentation. Sorry for the internet uh, issue. It's okay, Dr. Halima. Thank you so much for the uh, great lecture. And uh, we'll move on now to the last lecture uh, to be presented by Dr. Sumayya Al-Amri. 
Hmm. So before I, I introduce Dr. Samaya, we will take uh, the questions at the end of the session. So you can put in the chat box for the Q&As. Uh, if you want to look at the answers, uh, most of the questions were for Dr. Divya. So she answered and one of the questions was for me. So please, you can review them in, review them in the Q&As, but then we'll move to the chat box later on in the last uh, half an hour. So um, Dr. Sumaya, Dr. Sumaya Al-Amri is a maternal fetal medicine uh, consultant um, at Royal Hospital since 2015. She graduated from Sultan Qaboos University in 2004, and then she completed residency training at the Oman Medical Speciality Board. Uh, and she passed the Arab board exam and OMSP exam in 2012 and 13, respectively. She completed her training in maternal fetal medicine as a subspeciality in King Faisal Hospital and Research Center in Riyadh. In 2014, she's involved in many uh, national committees and also as a member of the National M Maternal Mortality Committee and Minister of Health. She is also a member of the Oman Society of Ultrasound and ob -Gyne. And she is a faculty or a trainer, uh, training the residents at the Oman Medical Speciality Board. She's going to be talking about making a decision, normal or not. So welcome, uh, Dr. Sumaya. Thank you, Dr. Nihal, for your introduction. Um, <clears throat> I think my lecture will be uh, just a recapping to whatever was mentioned in the previous today and the previous two days. Um, it is the last, uh, it's actually the last step in the 20 plus two uh, strategy of uh, scanning, um, uh, of fetal scan. So uh, it is about sweep uh, two uh, and making decision is it whatever we have seen is normal or abnormal at the end of your um, of our examination. Okay, so I hope by at the end of this lecture, you will be able to describe how to perform a transverse overview or sweep of the fetal body from neck to sacrum, recognize the differences between the normal and most common abnormal ultrasound appearance that can be excluded by transverse overview or sweep. So we know that sweep one was the first uh, plane or the first movement done when we st start our fetal scan. Then we go for the 20 um, planes. Then we go for the transverse sweep, which is sweep two. So the key question is, what probe movements are required to perform a transverse overview sweep of the fetal body correctly? Which parts of the fetal anatomy are best assessed using the, this overview, the transverse overview? Uh, what are the key ultrasound features that distinguish between the correct and the incorrect view of the vertebra in uh, cross section? And which abnormality should be excluded after, a perform, after performing a transverse overview um, uh, correctly? So that the transverse overview is like when you finish your ultrasound uh, examination and you finish your 20 plane, you need to go like a thorough um, um, sweep through uh, the, the, the fetus, starting from the neck to sacrum. It's, it's a full assessment of the thorax, body, and the pelvis. And it, <clears throat> it visualizes the vertebra from the thorax to the sacrum. And, it's, and also you can, uh, define out your anatomical landmark uh, during those uh, steps. So um, here is like um, the ultrasound, how we do that. We start, can you see my, uh, oh, sorry. We start here, um, starting from the, uh, the neck of the fetus and we slide our probe in the transverse section. We slide the probe down, keep on sliding According to the curvature of the fetus uh, or the position, <clears throat> we need to rotate a bit. And this is a bit of rotation. The amount of ro rotation depends on the position and the, how the baby is flex, flexing his him, him herself. Um, then we need to slide more, slide, slide, and rotate till we reach the, um, um, the sacrum. So uh, we go to the anatomical landmark when, when we start sweeping from up to down. So once we start from the thorax, the first thing we encounter <clears throat> in, the, um, uh, in the, our transverse sections is the three vessel view, the three vessel trachea view, which already Dr. Halima and Dr. Uh, Tamima talk about it. 
Then we go a bit down to reach the uh, four chamber view of the heart, going more down into the abdomen and we see the stomach bubble more down and we can see both kidneys here. Then we go a bit more down to see the cord attachment. And finally, we can see the, uh, the bladder. So it's a full assessment, a quick sweep from thorax, abdomen, and pelvis. And we have to make sure that we visualize the three dots of the vertebra in all our um, uh, uh, sections. See, um, this is the um, this is a diagram which showing the feet, a cross section of the fetus, and the triangle is indicating the vertebra. So um, during the transverse sweep overview, the vertebra can be at any of these position or any other position. So it can be at at uh, 12 o'clock, uh, half past one, three, seven, or nine o'clock position. And in each position, you can um, see different organs um, uh, of the fetus, and the position will influence your, your ability to detect um, um, if there is any abnormality, and you can um, uh, see if, uh, um, if you can move the fetus. Actually, in the second trimester, it's easier to to influence the position of the fetus because the fetus size is still small and you can uh, have your movement and uh, change the position of the vertebra. It might be a bit difficult in the third trimester, but you should be able to do it in second trimester. And sometimes you can ask the mother, like uh, in, not in the same setting, um, uh, you, you will be able to see the whole thing. You can ask the mother to go come back in 20 minutes and we can repeat the scan and the fetus moved um, from its uh, position. So <clears throat> now we will just go, whatever would, it will come now, it, it was already explained thoroughly by the other uh, speakers. And uh, I'm just um, showing you more videos about um, uh, some no ab normal and abnormal sections of the fetus. If you can see here, here the vertebrae is in this video is at almost 12 o'clock position. And in this video, um, uh, we can see the vertebra, though we cannot see the coverage of the skin throughout because the, the, the baby is stuck to the uterus. But I can see clearly um, the, the lungs here. Um, I can see heart beating, though it's not that clear, stomach, kidneys, and bladder. Uh, it can be seen on this um, um, uh, video, though uh, I cannot comment on if there is any skin defect over the uh, spine or not. So I have to look in another section to make sure that I don't have any issue. Here is more a magnified picture. And here is um, it's uh, the position of the vertebra is more to the two uh, or one o'clock. So I can see more of more of fluid here. And I can you can um, follow the skin covering more clearly just to make sure that there is no spina bifida. And also in this section, you can see the kidneys seen very clearly, bladder, and from the beginning here, um, okay, uh, you can see the lungs, heart, kidneys, stomach bubble there. Okay, so. In this position, we were able to see the skin more clearly than the previous position. Here is more laterally, the vertebra, and you can see this more, more and more clearly, the lungs we could see, kidneys, cord attachment, and uh, bladder. Okay, if we go again, uh, we can see also here lungs, heart, stomach bubble kidneys and cord attachment. So the position of the baby, it will influence the finding um, that we can get from every um, uh, section. So we have to keep on moving, finding out the appropriate section to, to get whatever we, we need to look at. So this is what, at three o'clock, a good amniotic fluid going down. This is the heart, lungs, stomach, good stomach bubble, kidneys, Bladder. Okay, so and also we can see part of the lower limb and the two bones of the lower limb and the feet. Okay, so 
this is another video, which is the same. You can see here in the cross, you could see the three vessel, heart, cord attachment, and a bladder. And you could have seen the sex of the baby as well. So according to the position, it makes a difference for us what we can see. In this, you have to concentrate a bit. If you have noticed, there is a finding which is written at the top of this screen. Um, there is a loss of the skin covering the, um, and the spine. There is, it's an intact here, intact, still intact. And there is a loss. And there is a, a cystic structure protruding from the lower part of the spine, which is myelomeningocele. If you can see the shape of the uh, vertebrae is changed into a U-shaped, and there is an opening. This is a, a spina bifida. That's why it's really important to make sure that you have a good amount of lichen behind the spine before you comment on there is no spina bifida or, or it's an, an intact. So you have to be really careful on, uh, on this examination. Um, so when you have an, a finding, you have to make sure of that finding by going to another plane. So this is you have already um, um, uh, had a thorough examination. This is supposed to be the last sweep in your examination. Um, so once you find that you get you got the finding again, you have to make sure and go, uh, go to the other um, planes that to confirm your abnorm the abnormality. If you can see here, this is what is what is the banana shaped uh, cerebellum. Um, Dr. Tamima talked about it today, and in this picture there is the U shaped vertebrae and this is the opening of the of the skin covering and this is an unsagittal view where you can see the myelomeningocele uh, protruding um, uh, on this section so if you have a finding confirm it in more than one plane so you don't depend on one uh, on, on one plane only to to get a diagnosis so what we can exclude <clears throat> Uh, from uh, the transverse sweep. First of all, you need to make sure of your situs anomaly. Is make sure that it is situs solitus, um, heart and um, heart and the stomach on the same side, on like it's pointing to the left side. And uh, Dr. Tamim explained the way of um, making sure of the situs uh, solitus. I I usually use the same way of Dr. Titia used. Like I imagine myself in. Uh, as, um, as the fetus and de decide where, which is the right and which is the left. And once you make first, the first thing you have to find out is the situs anomaly. Then if you can see here, uh, Dr. Um, Halima showed a very good pictures and explanation of the cardiac anomaly. And you can see here, there is a canal, a BSD canal. There is um, uh, an anomaly in the four chamber view. And here, a, a monoventricular or a univentricular, where is only one functioning um, uh, ventricles, and the other one is hypoplastic, which is left hypoplastic heart. Uh, in this picture, you can see that this is the chest, this is the ribs, and the heart is protruding outside. This is ectopia cordis. And once you you have such a major anomaly, look for another another anomaly. Usually, it's asymptomatic and coming with other congenital anomaly. So you have to go back and scan the fetus thoroughly. Um, here you can see there is a significant pericardial effusion of more than four millimeter. We have seen uh, Dr. Halima's lecture. There is some um, minimal pericardial effusion, which might not be of much of significance, but here it's really uh, a significant one. So this is the thorax looking at the heart anomaly. Then we can also, um, um, go to in the thorax looking at the lungs. So in the lungs here, if you can see, this is a cystic um, malformation, um, uh, the cecum or pulmonary uh, malformation, where you have an echogenic lung with some cystic uh, um, structure, which is, uh, you, should, yeah, you shouldn't panic and you shouldn't make the mother scared a lot because most of these cases, um, they resolve later on and uh, disappear and the lungs will be functioning. So it's you just document your finding and um, um, refer for a better counseling because uh, you will be surprised how these most of like 40 to 50% of them will resolve 
later in, in pregnancy. And uh, you can see here also that the stomach and the heart at the same cross section, this is the heart pushed and the stomach pushed to the uh, right, the stomach is here. And here also you can see the stomach high in the, in the, uh, in the uh, thoracic uh, thorax. Uh, so it is, um, it's not in, it's a correct position. It is a diaphragmatic hernia. We can see also in this picture, there is some pleurifusion, significant one with a skin edema um, indicating uh, hydrops uh, fetalis. Okay, so as we said, always confirm in two, at least two planes your findings before uh, deciding on the anomaly. Uh, then we go to the abdomen, um, uh, looking, we are still on our transverse sweep. Uh, and once you decide wh which, which is right, which is left, we need to know that the heart and stomach should be, this is the same fetus, the same um, ultrasound of the same fetus. So the heart is pointing here, but the stomach on the, the other side. So it's, there is a situs abnormality uh, in, in this fetus. And you can see here, as Dr. Tamima have shown in her presentation, there is a situs which can be a part of an, another abnormality or can be isolated. So we have to look uh, at it. Um, Cross-section without a stomach bubble. So we have to make sure, is it a stomach bubble? It is there or it is not there. Um, we need to decide if the stomach there or there, looking also at the uh, amount of the lichen. Is, is there any uh, polyhydromnus that might indicate there is some esophageal atresia or it is a normal lichen? If it is a normal lichen, you can just continue your scanning and come back, see if the stomach is filling, or you can ask the patient to go and come back in 20, another 20 minutes and look for the stomach before saying that the stomach is absent because it can. Um, just be, at the time you, you are scanning, it just got emptied. Duodenal atresia, you can see here the double bubble. Usually duodenal atresia, 40% of them cannot like rarely seen before 24 weeks of gestation. That's because the amount of uh, fluid swallowed by the fetus in the uh, early gestation is, is minimal. So uh, whatever gone into the duodenum, it will be absorbed. But when the patient, when the fetus is getting bigger and swallowing more and more fluid, so the the uh, the, the duodenum will not be able to um, absorb all that. So uh, we can see the double bubble more clearly after 24 weeks of gestation. But you can, if you are lucky enough, you can see it before that. And this is the uh, an ultrasound of a fetus at 20 weeks of gestation. This is a very easy uh, slide. You can see here it's an ecogenic um, bowel. Imagine that this is the vertebra and which is supposed to be the most ecogenic and, the, uh, and uh, but the bowel is more ecogenic than the vertebra and it's an, an easy slide. If you can see here, this is um, also a picture which was shown by Dr. Tamima is when this bowel is outside the abdominal cavity. This is the cord attachment, stomach is here and it is not covered in this gastroschisis. And uh, we have another uh, abdominal wall defect, which is the umphalocele uh, with some fluid um, around the bowel. And most like once, once we diagnose umphalocele, we have to think of a chromosomal abnormality, which is not uh, a case in gastroschisis. Okay, so uh, sometime we, we have um, a horrible uh, cases where we cannot see anything because our uh, because there was there is no lichen at all and um, lichen is play, playing um, a, a, a big role in having a good ultrasound um, uh, diagnosis because it's giving us the acoustic uh, window. So in this case, there is it, it, there are, it is an anhydromnus, and you are looking for the kidneys where the kidney is not. Um, it's not uh, present. So this fetus with bilateral renal agenesis, um, and uh, it's it's difficult when there is no lichen, and you have to be really clear because you are diagnosing an an absence of an organ. It's not that the abnormality of an or, of organ. So you have to 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 look at it in different planes and make sure that there is no other reason of the anhydramnus or the oli severe oligohydramnus in this fetus before getting the diagnosis of bilateral agenesis. 
You can see in this picture there is cystic renal dysplasia. This is a, a kidney which has <coughs> multicystic um, um, uh, abnormality. And um, if it is bilateral, in these cases you will not find, you, you will not be able to see the bladder because it's, it will be an unfunctioning kidneys. And you can see here the uh, distended um, uh, bladder, which is uh, indicating the lower urinary tract obstruction. And you, if you see here, it's maybe there's some starting of renal pelvis dilatation um, of both kidneys. This is the bladder extending up to the kidney level. Uh, here is, uh, uh, we can see the renal pelvic dilatation. And uh, as Dr. Tamima said that we need to measure it in a cross section, um, how much is dilatation and should not be more than seven. And um, this is the two uh, vessel cord when we want to diagnose, look at the, around the bladder, if you have two umbilical cord or umbilical vessels or one. So uh, when it is only one, we call it, we diagnose it as two um, uh, vessel cord uh, um, uh, cord. Uh, and you can see here also the sacro oxygen teratoma um, in the lower part of the pelvis. So once you diagnose, go for other claims, okay? So uh, making a decision. So when we encounter a structure or measurement that um, uh, not within the normal and um, very much, you have to confirm it in more than one plane um, because you need to confirm your diagnosis. Confirm the measure, me measurement at least twice, like because some of the measurements are reproducible. Make sure that you, have getting, you are getting the correct section before you decide on your measurement. Continue and once you find an abnormality, you shouldn't stop and give us scary faces because the patient will be looking at you. The patient is facing you, so she will get scared. And she, they, might, uh, actually, they might stop you from um, continuing the scan and, uh, and you will not be able to find more and more uh, finding because you will be busy calming them down. So try not to show on your face if you find any abnormality, continue your scan, reassess. Um, if you want to re later on before you, um, uh, uh, document your finding. At the end, you should you share with the parent your concern, which uh, uh, of uh, concern the fetus, which might not uh, be normal. Only when you have finished your, your full scan. So I don't comment on your scan before you are done with it, because if you wanted to look at other things, you might be might not be able later because the you will be um, uh, the parent will be. Uh, 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 like uh, anxious, they will be upset and they will not, they might not allow you to continue your scan. And if you are not really confident of your finding, you have to make sure with your supervisor or your another seniors and refer to the specialist for a better um, uh, diagnosis. See, if you, if you looked at this, um, um, uh, this is a, a three pictures, which is measuring the posterior horn of the lateral ventricle. One of them, it's the same, actually it's the same fetus, uh, but the, it's three different measurements. The first picture, the first foot is nine, it's measuring between 9.6 to 9.9. .9. The middle one is 10 millimeter, the last one is 10.4. So how we decide which one is, like if it is 9.6, we I don't know, I don't need to go for further uh, evaluation. If it is 10 and more than 10, I need to look for what's the reason of it. It's, 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 it's the cut point where we, we should say that it is normal or abnormal. So you have to make sure that your cut is correctly. If you see to the, if you look at this foot in here, I cannot see actually the fat cerebri very clearly. I cannot see the cavum, so it's not a correct cut. Here also, the cavum is not shown, though the falx is there, but the cavum is not that clear. So I'm, 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 I'm doubting the cut here, but if I looked here, it's a very nice falx uh, seen horizontally with a good cavum. So this is a, a better, uh, the correct cut to take the measurement. So 
after seeing this, it's like we can say it's normal and there is no need for further uh, evaluation. Is the stomach absent or not? In the cross section, couldn't see in. We went to the corona, we went to sagitt sagittal, couldn't see in. But don't comment on uh, stomach absent or not until you wait for another 20 minutes and look at it again before comment, especially when there is a normal amniotic fluid. So we have to reassess in 10 to 20 minutes if there is um, a stomach bubble or not. Okay. Okay. Is the bowel echogenic or not? We have we we see a lot of reference that it's echogenic bowel. We have to make sure that about the definition of echogenic bowel. If the patient is having low BMI, the placenta is posterior. It will give us a perfect view to see the, if, the, if it's an echogenic bowel um, or not. And if you, in doubt, what you do, you <coughs> turn down the gain to assess whether the bowel as bright as the bone. If the bowel are not as bright as the bone, so it's not an echogenic. So if you can see in this, we turn down the gain. This is the bone. I cannot, this is the same, the same cutter. This is the heart, this is the heart. And uh, so whatever called here echogenic, I cannot see it here anymore. So in this case, it is and not echogenic. So this is the way to make sure that whatever you call it echogenic is really echogenic or not. So the key point when performing a transverse sweep, the position of the spine is vital for the evaluation of anatomical structure. So um, according to the position of the vertebra, the spine and the vertebra, you can find out um, uh, different um, uh, uh, abnormalities. The spine should appear as three ossified center in the triangular shape covered by skin. When the three ossified centers appear as U-shape, think of spina bifida and confirm it in multiple uh, planes. Confirm the anomaly looking at the head, looking at the spine in different uh, plane. When encountering an abnormal appearance or measurement, continue to complete the scan, confirm, in multiple planes and with multiple measurement before communicating with the parents uh, your final decision uh, to refer, or if you are a fetal medicine specialist, uh, what is the further uh, uh, management or evaluation needed. It's not your role to make a diagnosis if you are still under training, but you should be familiar with the range of a normal appearance. And whenever you are in doubt, don't hesitate to refer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sumeya, for the uh, comprehensive lecture, recapping everything. <laughs> it was very nice. I think now we'll open, the, we'll start, we'll, we'll take some few questions. I think the Q&A has been answered. And thank you, Dr. Divya. It's a lot of questions around your, uh, your topic. But I'll just go through the chat box. There were a couple of questions I noted. One of them, again, I think it was in the Q&A, also the presence of lacunae, is it always associated with placenta accreta? I think I'll let you answer because, and should I refer this patient, uh, you know, if she scans in the primary or secondary care to a, uh, a senior person? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think this is a recurring question which everyone keeps asking that uh, if you see uh, hypoechoic spaces in the placenta, first, are they lacunae or are they placental lakes? So um, placental lakes typically are more, uh, they are less, they are few in number and they are more regular. And uh, if you switch on color and uh, try to look for vascularity in placental lakes, normally you will not be able to pick up any blood flow. And if even if you have to pick up the blood flow, you really have to bring down your PRF, the pulse repetition frequency, which I'm sure you must have discussed uh, in the previous uh, two days. So you have to bring the PRF very low to pick up the slow flow, which is seen in normal placental lakes. Sometimes even after a very low PRF, you're not able to see any flow. Uh, in contrast, the lacunae are more in number. So as a result, the placenta has a very heterogeneous kind of appearance and they are very irregular. And even on the uh, real time in 2D, you can see blood moving uh, fast with swirling blood within these lacunae. And if you would put color Doppler, then because you can actually see on grayscale uh, fluid moving within the lacunae, they will easily pick up color even on Doppler. You will not have that much difficulty in picking up color. But please don't just, uh, don't go with the idea that just seeing placental lacunae is equal to diagnosis of placenta accreta spectrum. That is not the case. In a lady who is at high risk, for instance, she's had a previous LSCS and who has a placenta previa, if you see placental lacunae, 
that should prompt you to look for other signs, the other signs which I spoke about on grayscale and color Doppler. And more the number of signs that you see, more confident is the diagnosis uh, of morbidly adherent. So just simple lacuna is not equal to diagnosis of placenta accreta spectrum. You have to look for the retroplacental lucency, myometrial thinning, uh, abnormality at the bladder uterine interface, increased vascularity. So I would encourage you that actually from today onwards, when you see a normal patient who has undergone a previous cesarean section, please look at the normal retroplacental space, the normal uterovesical space, the normal uterovesical vascularity in a lady who has a previous C-section, but not a low placenta, or so that you get an idea of what the normal looks like. And then you kind of understand when it's abnormal. So you know when the myometrium is thin, you know what is absent lucency. So please get familiar with the normal appearance and more the number of signs that you see of placenta, more like confident is your diagnosis of pass. You don't make the diagnosis only on one sign that is lacuna. Thank you. Very clear, Dr. Divya. Another question, I think, <clears throat> maybe just for the, for the others to uh, know about the diagnosis of placenta previa, why not by transabdominal? I think you answered it, but maybe just for the arrest, maybe yes, some people. I are... think uh, you are concerned that uh, transvaginal would cause bleeding or something. So uh, please don't worry. Transvaginal sonography is perfectly safe uh, in placenta previa. And since transvaginal sonography gives you a very clear images of the internal loss and the lower edge of placenta, that is why we rely on transvaginal and not on transabdominal. And sometimes with transabdominal, because of shadowing of the fetal parts, it's very difficult to see the internal loss and lower edge of placenta. So that is why TVS is superior to TS and TVS is safe in placenta previa. No problem. Thank you again, uh, Divya. Uh, there are, I think, two or three more questions. One question is for me, which one is best option to take measurement of the umbilical artery doctor by auto trace or manual trace? Um, I think I elaborated a bit, but maybe it was too fast that if the pulse waveform, it's clear and um, you get like at least uh, four to five clear cycles, I think auto trace and with no other interruptions of day, which should be okay. But to in very uh, occasion when the baby's breathing and the difficulty of getting a proper umbilical uh, artery uh, pulse wave or in the cardiac cycle, or then we can use the manual trace. I think we all agreed that you can take the best one or two um, cycles and measure the pulsatility index to get a proper uh, ratio. Would you like to add anything? I think that's the, we, the machines can calculate both auto trace and manual trace. Uh, and then there's another question to take, uh, is it okay to take measurement if the wave is downward or it should be inverted for measurement? I think also I said, uh, it's advisable not to invert um, so you don't change, uh, you have, a, you know, the color flow, or, or sorry, the, the flow of the vessel is away from the probes, and it might affect the, the uh, slightly affect the indices of the PI value if you invert uh, uh, the, uh, the umbilical artery Doppler. So it's fine to take it in the downward um, uh, below the baseline. Um, I think that's it. I don't see any questions. They all... Thank you remarks and they would like to sh they would like to have the lectures and I think Dr. Moza maybe will having yeah I have a, a closing um, remarks she can mention about what we did in the last uh, yes thank you so much yeah I just have um, two questions to Halima because we do get a referral and I want just like a, a way of uh, education for, 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 for the attending. Uh, regarding the foramen ovary, because Halima we do get a lot of questions, I mean a lot of referral regarding abnormal foramen ovary with foramen ovary prolapse. So please comment on this and uh, let's clarify this point, whether this is normal or abnormal variant. Uh, thank you, Moza. Uh, I think maybe you mean when they are saying uh, the aneurysmal uh, atrial septum. Yes, yes. Yeah. yes. The, and at the same time, also regarding the other question is about right atrium is larger than the left atrium, but you have already said that right atrium is composed like one third and uh, the other three chamber is two third. So that is also a normal variant. If you just also clarify that. Right. So for the first part regarding the aneurysmal atrial septum, this is a benign condition. Uh, I think not to worry uh, about it. 
as long as it is in the left uh, atrium. The same thing regarding the um, um, ASD secundum. So not to tell the lady that there is an ASD secundum because this will be like a normal finding and most of the time it will close. The size is not accurate uh, antenatally and always will tell them this is a limitation. The, the size of the ASD secundum, the small VSD, the minor valve uh, abnormality. Now regarding the second part about the dilated right atrium, it's not only one thing. We have to take the, it's collectively. Is it the right atrium, the whole right side? Is it right atrium, right ventricle, uh, dilated, any uh, TR, or not only one uh, structure? But at the end, uh, myself, if there is, for example, any doubt, uh, I'm happy to answer the referral, even if I, if I, can, I can tell the referring physician, uh, not to worry, this is benign. Uh, what are about the other abnormalities and the kind of uh, education. But the important thing is not to make the lady anxious. That's the most important thing. Uh, the other thing about the bilateral SVC, uh, Moza, thank you because you opened the floor. So uh, sometimes it is a variant as long as the left SVC is draining into the coronary sinus, this is a, a variant, but again, it's a benign condition, not to make the lady also uh, anxious about it. Thank you, Halima. Thank you. Uh, any more question? I think, uh, Mihal, do you have any more questions? I think there's one question. Sometimes, Omrania, we can see the normal diastolic flow, or I, I guess the umbilical artery double. But the readings will come higher side. With, what is the explanation? I think I mentioned that sometimes I think the error of how, uh, <clears throat> how to take, you don't take one measurement when And there is doubt, you have to repeat the measurement, you have to avoid fetal breathing, you have to make sure that you are, the mother maybe is not breathing, too much movements might affect the reading. Uh, you need to lose, use a uh, free loop uh, and you have to make sure you use the proper charting uh, to compare the gestational age. So we don't just, you know, people will say, hi, I'm high and actually it's not high for like 32 weeks or 28 weeks. Uh, the other thing we said, we have to zoom in, uh, make sure that you don't, you know, the, um, the color map Doppler is clear and you align uh, your, um, vessel perpendicular with the with the pulse wave uh, gate and maybe to make sure it's not too small not too wide and the box is i think it's the technique more than anything so if you think there's an error please uh, repeat uh, two or three measurements you can and if it's still uh, high uh, then maybe you can wait for a few minutes or repeat it in the next few days of course, absent and, and diastolic flow or reversed it's unlikely to have an error in that and that's why i said it really predicts the Mobility and it's more sensitive. Uh, I hope, I, I don't know, Dr. Moza, do you agree with this or anything else we can add? No, I think <laughs> Doppler I is a difficult. Yeah. A difficult. Yeah. No, I agree with you, Dr. Nehal, but the most important thing is also. Not hands on, really. Yeah, the most the important thing is you need to uh, correlate your finding with the gestational age. So high umbilical artery pulsatility index at 20 weeks, for example, is different at 24 weeks is different from one at 32 weeks. So correlate your finding. I mean, after you make sure that uh, your uh, screening or your diagnostic way is correct and according to the criteria of screening or diagnosing, then correlate your finding with the gestational age. Finding at 24 weeks is could be normal but it could be abnormal at 32 or 34 weeks. So it is important to interpret your finding according to the gestation age. Thank you, Moza. I think uh, all thank you words. I didn't understand what's to, I, I want to know about the post-test evaluation. Yeah, this is yeah, one of okay. the- <laughs> Yeah, before. <laughs> So uh, tomorrow will be our last day yes. in the basic training uh, workshop. And uh, we'll start also at 4 o'clock and we'll end, but hopefully we'll end by 8 o'clock, but sometime we may get like late, like 8.30. Um, during, I mean, at the end of the session, we will send again a link for the post test. So all are requested to go through the post test and to answer the questions and uh, that is in order for you to get the, um, whether it is attendance certificate or if you want, would like to continue with the ISWAG 
for to to go for the practical and then to get the certification of competence for the basic uh, training. So that is regarding the uh, post assessment. And as I said, uh, tomorrow also we will send you a reminder regarding how to uh, get um, to the session tomorrow. So I would like to thank all those who attended and stayed till now, which is late for everybody. And also to, uh, I mean, great thankful to our uh, speakers. Um, so inshallah, we'll uh, meet tomorrow. So thank you and uh, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum yeah, thank, thank you so much. much. Thanks everybody. Good night. And thanks thank you. Ma'asalam. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Vidavia.